It is absolutely wonderful to be here. Um, so far from my home, but in a place that's already made me feel quite at home. So I want to thank you um, already to the festival. Thank you all of you who came. And um, yeah, I, I do want to talk about empathy. Empathy is, um, it's a challenging thing to talk about right now. It's opposite in my mind, is actually something nearing destruction. And as I think about empathy, destruction can be created in a moment. Destruction can be created on a macro scale for many people all at one time. But empathy is different. Empathy is harder. Empathy comes one person at a time, which makes empathy not only a challenge, it, it makes it it makes it imperative that it's personal. So the only way I know how to talk about it is personally. I'm going to share some stories with you today, stories that come from me, from inside of me, from a history that's mine. But it's my hope that regardless of whether or not you connect with all of the events of a life, my life, that the the symbols, the, the pieces of it do connect with you. And if by the time we are finished, it makes some kind of resonance and something that you can take away from here. I, I think it will. I think it will. I want to start with a story that happened 20 some years ago when my wife and I were in West Africa. We were in West Africa, Mali to be specific, the name of the country. And as we were in Mali, we landed in the capital of Bamako and our goal was to get to Timbuktu. Timbuktu, of course, northern, uh, northern Mali. And my goal, or my, my job, I should say, my job was to bring the water. That was my only job. And uh, Mali was extremely hot, uh, 120 or so it was. I don't know what it is here. It's also extremely hot here. Don't get me wrong. But it was extremely hot there. And my wife and I were inside the, the cab of a pickup truck, a white pickup truck on this little, little road, I guess they called it a road, that was heading up from Bamako to Timbuktu. And, and about halfway through, my wife made uh, some kind of gesture. She was thirsty. And of course, it was at that, that point I realized I had no water. I had forgotten water. It was my only job, and I forgot. And, and I, I tapped the driver on the shoulder, made the universal, I'm really thirsty sign. And he pulled over and, uh, and pointed off to the distance. And the distance was a little village. And we started walking to this village. It looked like it wasn't too far away. But by, as we were walking underneath the sun's heat, it turned out it was quite a ways away. And by the time we reached it, it was midday. A and this little village had a clay, uh, clay uh, wall around it. And nobody was in sight except for one woman. And she looked to be somewhere between 18 and 81 years old, somewhere in that little range. And she's leaning her back against the clay wall. And I didn't, hadn't been in the country very long. I didn't know the social mores, how you deal with this. But I went up to the woman. And I, my dad has taught me, when you meet someone new, reach out and give them a firm handshake. So I went over to the woman who was sitting down, back to the wall. And I reached out my hand and said, hello. And she just looked up at my hand for quite some time, and then finally slowly reached her hand up. And I grabbed her hand, and I gave her hand a firm handshake. And as soon as I did that, she pulled her hand back very fast, struggled to get up, and kind of scuttled around the edge of the wall. And I thought, well, you know, what have I done? Have I done something horrible here? And that's when I noticed my hand. It still felt kind of strange. And I looked in my hand, and I had about this much of her finger in the palm of my hand, had broken off. She was a leper, she was. I had broken off a piece of her finger I had. And the first thing you do when you realize you're still holding someone's finger and they are gone, you, you drop that. And then the second thing you do is you start to think. And I started to realize, oh my word, I have I've never been in a place like this before. And I started to think about her. I said, I never met anyone like her before. I started to think how different we were. How she was a woman, I was a man, that we were different races. I think she's probably dying. I think I'm still living. How our, our, our 
religions were probably different. I, I probably couldn't think of anything that was the same. And then something came into my mind, and, and it kind of broke all of those thoughts. It said, yeah, there is something that we share. And it's bigger than all of those other pieces. And somehow I think it gets at the core of empathy. We were both, and still are, if she's still alive, human. Both human. Somehow there is something about us both being human, which is very easy to forget when we meet someone we don't understand. We kind of forget their humanity. But, but something about us each being human, which connects us. And I want to talk about that today, those connective pieces. Because somehow if we can connect to each other on a very basic human level, apart from all of these things about us that we put on each other, that we see first, somehow I think we are on our way to empathy. We're on the road. So I'm going to take you back to when I was six years old. When I was six years old, my folks took me to, because I am from the United States, a state called Nebraska. And if you are in the United States, you don't want to go to Nebraska. There's nothing there. In fact, if you're a child, you sleep through Nebraska. There's nothing to see. It's just corn, and it's just flat. And so and my, my folks took me there, but they took me there for a good reason, because my grandfather lived there on a farm that to a six-year-old looked like a million acres large. It was a huge farm. And, and, they, and when I go to my grandfather's, he would take me to these things called farm auctions. I don't see a lot of farms around Singapore, <laughs> but if you've ever been to a farm auction in central United States, they, do, they look something like this. A bunch of farmers sitting in the field, or sit field, <laughs> sitting in the field, they're sitting in, in chairs, <laughs> and, and they bring up uh, all of these things that they're going to bid on. And they, they bid, they're totally still, these farmers. They just sit there, and, and they haul a half-dead pig or a half-dead cow up there, and then the farmers start to bid. But they don't raise their hand when they want to bid on it. They just make a little movement, like one farmer might do, <sighs> another farmer might go like this, and another farmer, you know, like this. And I was six years old. I was looking at you, look around, and you try to see who's bidding. It was, and it was interesting to try to see everybody and their little movements, because that's how you bid. And, and the person who's auctioning off these things, very fast-talking person, and two people on either side looking for these little motions. Okay, the last thing that came up did not look like it was junk to me. It was big, and it was tractory. It was a combine, which brings in a lot of corn all at one time. And the bidding started at $10,000. And the auctioneer speaks very fast. And so he started, ooh, give me 10, like that. <laughs> and we got up to $30,000. And at $30,000, my right shoulder did something it had never done before. My right shoulder did this. And you can jerk your shoulder anywhere you want to. But if you jerk your shoulder at a farm auction, you are in a heap of trouble. <laughs> you might just bid $30,000 on a farm combine. I did. All of a sudden, a spotter pointed at my grandfather, who was kind of a snoozer, but now he is very much awake. And in the moment, he has a $30,000 bid on him. <laughs> and fortunately for my life, the bidding continued. We got to $40,000. At $40,000, my right hand, I didn't want it to. It just did it. It shot up in the sky. And I remember looking at my grandfather through my right fingers. His terrified face was looking back at me. He grabs my wrist and shoves it down. And he says, Jonathan, lower your hand. He couldn't say his THs very well. And I did. I actually kept my hand down with my other hand. And fortunately, we didn't win the tractor. But on the way back to home, back to the inner city where I lived, lying in the back of the family Chrysler wagon, I was looking up at the sky, and, and my shoulder now was alive. And so I could have had a string on it with a, somebody, a crazed puppeteer, pulling the string on it, and my shoulder just kept going up and down, and I couldn't figure out what's going on. It's like I had a mind of its own. And I get back to Minneapolis, which is where I lived, and that one tick, which is what it turns out to be, a tick, from Tourette syndrome, which is what it turns out I had and have, Tourette syndrome, a disorder that makes my body move without me wanting it to. That one tick turned into two, when the next morning I'm getting ready for school, and all of a sudden my mouth starts popping open, and then the head starts to shake, the eyes, 
they start to blink. And then the arms, they started to go in and out, and the stomach was tensing, and seven, and eight, and nine ticks, all happening at the same time. I was in constant motion. Uh, but I was six years old. And I was six years old, in first grade, everybody was kind of weird. They just were. Kids at school were crawling on top of desks. They're crawling underneath. They're crawling inside of desks when they were six years old. I was just the moving boy. And so in six, six years old, people treated me all right, and seven as well, and eight, and nine, and 10, and 11, until I got to seventh grade. And in our system in seventh grade, they yank you from your elementary school, and they put you in a different school. It was called junior high. And as I walked in the front door of junior high, my first day, to give you a look at what I looked like, this was me. And this was me all the time. I, from the time I woke up, the time I went to bed, I couldn't stop any of it. And I don't know your school experience. I don't know how, if I, looking like this, would have walked into your school your first day, how I would have been treated. Maybe your school is big hearted, kind. My school, not so much. My school, the second day the game started, it was called Beat the Twitchy Kid. So I spent a fair amount of my seventh grade time on my back, in the hallway, kids around me, kicking, circle around them, shouting, fight, fight, fight. I wasn't fighting. So not, a, not an enjoyable place to go to school. But there was something that was enjoyable about seventh grade. There were girls in seventh grade. <laughs> now, I think there may have been a couple in sixth grade, too. But all of a sudden, in seventh grade, my eyes were opened. And they became girls. <laughs> so I will put you in algebra. In algebra, there were two seats in front of me and two seats behind me, two rows on either side. I was sitting right in the middle of the class. It's a rotten place to put someone with Tourette syndrome, but that's where they put me, right in the middle. And I was doing what I always did. I was looking to my left, because to my left was the lovely Krista. And she was a lot more fun to look at than the bald man up front. <laughs> this is a tragic irony. <laughs> Anyway, so I'm looking at Krista, and I'm looking at her the way I always looked at Krista, which was something like this. <laughs> and she was looking at me the way she always looked at me, which was, <sighs> we were tight. Anyway, I, I had a piece of paper out, and I, and I had my name written on it, John Friesen. And as I looked at that sheet, all of a sudden, the J, the O, the N, all the, all the letters, they started to get fuzzy. And I rubbed my eyes, and they stayed that way, peeked over at Krista, and now she's starting to look funny, too, like there's someone sticking in, has an eraser and is erasing her edges. The middle of her is clear, her edges are not. I look back at my paper, and now my paper, it, it, it's, it's more than fuzzy. The, the lines on my paper, they're just gone. And, and I look back at Krista, and now she's more than fuzzy, too. She's doubling. There's one Krista floating on top of the other one. And I thought to myself, which is the real Krista? And then I thought, if you have a floaty Krista, it doesn't matter who the real one is. You have to get to a nurse very quickly. So I stood up, and I took two steps forward. And that's when someone took a razor blade and slit my vision in half. And I went blind in the right eye. And my left eye, it started to flash on and off. I didn't know it, but I was having an epileptic seizure. First one I've ever had. I made it two more steps, and I passed out. I don't remember the rest of the class, but it was filled in when I got back. Apparently, even though I passed out, my body had more oomph in it. It walked to the front of the room where there was a table, and I lay down on this table in front of my seventh grade classmates. And I started to have a big grand mal seizure. I don't know if you've ever seen anybody have a seizure before, but if you have, you know they can be kind of scary. Mine was, my eyes were rolled back, my mouth was open, my arms are flailing. It threw me off the table where I landed on the tile floor and started to bloody my head because it was rhythmically hitting the ground. And here's where I should tell you about my teacher coming up and putting his hands underneath my head to protect me from me. But I can't tell you about him because when the seizure started, my teacher left the room to get the nurse, leaving me with my classmates. So the next person in the story comes from the back of the room, and his name was Dale. He was a take charge kind of kid. He had seen or heard some misinformation. People who have seizures, he heard, are going to swallow their tongues, he heard, and they're going to die. And he didn't want me to die. 
So he grabbed some pencils from his tray in his desk, and he came running up to where I was lying on my back with my eyes rolled back and my mouth open, and he stuck those pencils as deep down my throat as he could, I think with the intent of keeping my tongue out of my windpipe. But again, if you know about seizures, the jaw becomes very tight. And so I snapped the pencils like toothpicks. But he was not stopped, turning to the girls in the front row, and he grabbed some big pens, and he jabbed those big pens down my throat as well. And I snapped those two, woke up in a hospital about three hours later, very sore throat. <laughs> but a different thought. It wasn't the thought I had in the back of the car, which was something is wrong with me. It was, I am a freak. I know everyone saw this. Who, who is going to want to spend time with me? Who is going to have empathy on me? And I went back to school the next day. And I found out who wanted to spend time with me, nobody. And I went home and went into my basement bedroom, which is where it was, and I shut the door behind me, and I made a decision. I am never coming out. And I didn't for two years. For two years, I stayed locked in their bedroom. I came out to eat, and I came out to use the bathroom. And the first day of every week, they would literally drag me out, and they put me on this little bus that would take me to this little school. And I made it to school one hour through school, and then I'd go to the nurse. The nurse would call me, Mom, Mom would come pick me up, bring me back home to my basement bedroom. And that's just where I lived for two years. And while I'm down there, I start to write. But I wasn't writing books like I do now. I was writing the one thing I thought was never going to go away. The one feeling that made me feel a little bit better. I wanted to write it on something permanent. Because the only thing I could see that was permanent were my walls. So I started writing it all over my walls. And it was, God help me. I hate me. I hate me. I hate me. And I covered my walls with this freakish wallpaper. For a freak. And two years pass. And there's a knock on my door, and it's my mama. And we have a deal. She doesn't come in, I don't go out. We just talk through the door. And she said, John, you have a visitor. And I must have said, no, you don't. No, I don't. I, I, I haven't had one in two years. I don't have one now. And she says, uh, yeah, you do. She's upstairs. She? It's probably my grandmother. <laughs> but on the off chance that this was like a real she. I looked around at my room. You can make your room a pit in two years. It doesn't take that long. But mine certainly was. And I'm shoveling stuff into the closet. I'm hiding it under my bed, under the bedspread. And the knock comes again. And I'm like, oh, Ma, I need more time. I go to t open the door and I, to tell her that. And I look and oh, it's not my mom. It's the she. Walk, and I stand right there in the doorway, and the she, she's in, I recognize her. She's in my grade. She's short, but she's in my grade. And she smiles at me. And I stare at her, and she pushes by me and sits at the chair by, at my desk. And I just stayed standing in the hallway, because I have a she in my room, and I'm not quite sure what to do about that. But I backed up slow, and I sat down across from her. And for the next hour, that she, she just looked at me. And that she smiled at me, and she talked to me, and she made me feel, and here's this word again, human. She made me feel human. The first person in two years to do it. What did she say? I have no idea. It could have been a song. It could have been the Declaration of Independence. I don't know. I don't know what she said. But after one hour, she gets up, and she left. Just like she came in unannounced. And, and she had like a vacuum cleaner stuck on her back when she left. And she sucked something out of that room. And I'll tell you what she sucked out of that room, hate. She sucked the hate out. My hate for me. How did, how, how did she do it? You don't even know what she said. I, I tell you how she do it. She made me visible. She made me visible. And when someone makes you visible, you have a chance to be you have just a chance that maybe they actually are feeling empathy for someone. You can feel empathy for someone that you don't see. That woman I saw at the, at the wall in Africa, 
I, I could feel empathy for her only because I saw her. And how many of us walk by other humans? And in our humanity, we see them in their humanity, and we don't understand it, so we just keep on walking. It's what we do. It's our default. I don't understand it. I'm going to keep going. Even the kindest of us. Visibility leads to empathy. Empathy sets people free. It's a beautiful equation, and it's really hard to pull off. Because everything in us screams, I don't know this. I don't, it doesn't make sense to me. But she came. Whoever this person was, she came. And I didn't even know her name. And, and I was left sitting on my bed after she left. And I said, I don't want to be here anymore. And the next week, I went to school two days. Big deal. It was big for me. Then three days, and then four days, and then all the days. And it was great. No, it was still horrible. It was still horrible. Because <laughs> being out there, I was still this kid. And these kids, they were still those kids. But now, being out of my room was better than being locked in it because someone made me visible. Someone saw me. Somehow I got through school. Somehow I got through college. I became a special education teacher. I became a regular education teacher. Started to write. Became a professor and decided that whenever I write, I want to make sure that every character I write and every book that I write is feeling like I felt when I was stuck in my room for two years. And if you want to know, if you want to know how a person who feels so alone, you know what two questions they're asking? If you want to start the empathy process in your life, answer two simple questions, and they are simple for anybody you see. They're simply these, because they're all asking it. Does anybody see me? And does anyone like what they see? So every human on the face of this earth is asking, whether it's your four-year-old child or your 94-year-old mother, does anybody see me? Anyone like what they see? When my daughter was four, she wanted to be a ballerina. I stuck her in football. That's the kind of guy I am. <laughs> so I ripped off uh, the, uh, the tutu, and I uh, put her in the car, and we drove to the, the football field. And she got out of the car. And have you ever seen four-year-old football? It's not really a game. It's, it's like a whole herd of, I don't know, sheep or something. It's running around and kicking each other in the shins and screaming. That's kind of what it is. But, but, but so she got out in the field, and she had the purple uniform on, and she sees the whole team over there, and, and she runs over to the team, and she reaches out her hand to one of them. And one of them reaches out her hand back, and she's holding hands with one. I don't know who. who it's, oh, no. It's Emily. It's her best friend. is on her team. This will distract her. And sure enough, they sent her out into the field to play the game, and everybody is kicking each other, hurting each other, just like they're supposed to at four years old. And my daughter and Emily are on the other side of the field, and they're just skipping around the field. <laughs> and I'm on the sideline going, I should have left her in the tutu. The first game, she skips. The second game, she skips. The third, the fourth, the fifth game, she skips. And I, thank goodness there are only six games this season. I can't handle any more skipping. <laughs> but now she loves soccer. Soccer is like skipping practice when we go that last game. That last game. And she, and, and, and she goes out into the field, and she's looking for Emily, who's not there. No one has scored all year. 0-0 zero, zero every game. 30 players, one ball, it doesn't work to score. <laughs> but this last game, the game starts, and she's standing in the middle of the field, and, the, and people are starting to run around her. And she's just standing, because she's found a new friend. It's a butterfly. <laughs> and this butterfly is moving back and forth. And, that, and she's just communicating with this butterfly. Just, butterfly, butterfly, butterfly. <laughs> Everyone's running around. I wondered, would it be cruel for a dad to run out onto the field and pull out that butterfly and maybe, I, just, I, just wanted, to, I wanted to play one game. And at the end, fortunately, I didn't have to do that. The very end of the game, everyone's over there kicking each other, hurting each other, just like they're supposed to, and the ball squirts loose and goes right in front of my daughter. Goes, butterfly, butterfly, ball! And she starts to follow the ball. And she's going the right way. She doesn't know what she is. Going the right way. And she gets about... 10 feet from the goal, and I'm starting to get excited because I know my daughter's going to score because that goalie is sitting down, turned the wrong way, picking grass is what he's doing. <laughs> the, the goal is big. That boy is small. He won't even know my daughter's there. 
10 feet from the, from the net, she stops the ball. And she turns and looks at the sideline and she's looking for me. And she sees me and she says, Daddy. <laughs> Look at me, Daddy. <laughs> and being the gentle man, I, I see you kick the ball. <laughs> she says, okay, she says. And so she, she does what all little kids do before they kick it. She has to run backwards. <laughs> and she runs as fast as she can. And as soon as she gets there, all those other sheep surround her. And, and she's surrounded. I can't see her because she was kind of short, too. The kid is still picking grass. Nothing was, was getting by him. And then the ball goes back the other way. The herd thunders after her. It, except for one girl. My daughter is still stuck there. And now she's... I thought how sad she is. And she turns, though, and she has to walk back. And then she starts to jog back. And then she starts to skip back. And she gets in front of me, and she's... And I wave at her, like, why are we waving? You missed. And I figure out then, wait a minute. She didn't miss. She wanted to know if her daddy saw her, if her daddy liked what he saw. Because it's what we all want to know. They don't see me. They don't like what they see. I get a lot of letters. I thought when I became an author, I'd just get all sorts of fan mail. I don't get any letters. I get emails. No one sends letters anymore. But I get a lot of letters. They sound like this. Just came in. My little brother is almost 13 and has suffered from Tourette syndrome, what I have. For over four years, he's always been an awkward, gawky kid. This has made him an outcast at school. His twitches, he doesn't have any verbal twitches, make kids pick on him and teachers ignore him. He quite literally has no friends. I so wish I was kidding. He calls my mom at work from school almost every day with anxiety attacks, wanting to come home from school. My mom has spoken to the teachers and counselors. The counselor told her, I don't know what to do with him. The school doesn't care that he's ostracized and bullied on a daily basis, and he's starting to talk about suicide because he can't imagine living through high school like this. Mom's taking him to a psychiatrist. He told the woman outright that he wants to die. Please pray for my little brother. It's breaking my mother's heart. I ache for him so much. You know anybody who hurts that bad? You might. I did. Kid asks, does anybody see me? And he thinks of his teachers who make him invisible, and he says, no. Anyone like what they see? He thinks of his classmates who mock him. He says, no. And all of a sudden, suicide, which is a really rotten choice, becomes an understandable thought for a kid like that. I had 60 teachers between 7th grade and 12th grade when I came back out of my little imprisonment. 60, 59 saw me in their rooms, and 59 out of 60 said nothing. I'm not talking about my special ed teachers. They kind of had to like me. They were like my rent-a-friends. But just a regular teacher, 59 out of 60 said nothing. What did I want to say? Maybe something like this. Jonathan, I don't know what you're doing. I don't understand that, but if anything you need, I'd love to help. I'd love to help. You know, I was talking to 300 or so teachers in uh, uh, Colorado State not too long ago. Colorado right there in the shadows of the Rocky Mountains. It's pretty cold. This is in January. I love going to speak to teachers. One, it has a big impact. But number two, they treat me very well. <laughs> they put me up in nice hotels. They put me up in a nice hotel. They gave me two beds. I don't know why they did. It was just one me. Each bed had five pillows on it. Firm, extra firm, soft, extra soft. And number five, I don't know who he is, but he's always there. So ten pillows, one head. I slept on them all to get their money's worth. And anything I wanted for food, I just pick up that phone and say, food, it came. Except they didn't have the best food on the face of the earth, which we all know is the cashew. So I went across the street about midnight to get the, so my cashew fix. I went to the, to the supermarket there, and they, didn't, they were buying everything, so I didn't get the little 19 and a half cashews. I got the cashew jug, and I carried my cashew baby back towards my house, to my uh, Radisson hotel. 
and I got just to the street, and, and I, I took a look up to the left, and to my left there was a man, he was carrying everything he owned on his back. He was a homeless gentleman, and he was going to set up his night. He was sleeping between the vent of the Safeway supermarket and the dumpster. That's where he was going to sleep. And it was January, and it was cold and snowing, so he's putting down his cardboard bed in the slush. I'll sleep up in those two beds up there. He'll sleep in the slush. And I'm thinking in my mind, I have to, I have to say something, but you know how it is when you see someone who could use a little bit of help, and your heart wants to feel empathy, but somehow it just doesn't make the trip there. Your legs just have a little more brain in them and they kind of keep on walking. Because somehow we can't just relate. Like they didn't relate to me in school, so they just... And so I turned my head and I kept walking. And I got one step onto the street and I looked one more time. And I looked, when I looked, all of a sudden I, I, I froze and I jumped back. And I didn't jump back because I saw him, but I jumped back because he saw me. He had turned his head and he's on his knees now, and he's facing me. And his face was the most distorted face I've ever seen. His eyes were like this. His nose was on the side of his face. His mouth was, I don't know what creates a face like that, but that's what, and it froze me. And I just am standing there holding this big jug of cashews. And now I'm stopped. I have to do something. I thought, well, I gotta smile. Wait, 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 I didn't even buy these cashews. I should give him, give him the cashews. And I think, wait, wait, wait a minute. I wonder when the last time he slept on a bed was. I wonder when the last time he slept inside was. I have two of them. I can sleep in the lobby. It's nicer than my house. And so all those things running through my head, all these, all these, all these compassionate gestures I'm going to do, all these empathetic things. And I looked at him in the face, and I just turned. And I walked across the street, and I made him invisible. And I went into my hotel, went up 100 feet to my room, turned on my both two of my TVs, ate my cashews, and slept great that night, to my shame. Went 100 feet out, and 100 feet down, there's a guy lying in slush. And then the next morning, I get up, and even worse, I, I speak. And I, and I speak to 300 teachers and I tell them, do you know that walking through your halls every day are kids who, if they tell you the truth, they will tell you this, I feel invisible. And as soon as I say that, I almost wanted to throw up. I'm like, what a hypocrite. You just, you made a man invisible last night. Why didn't I do anything? It's what we do. It's our default setting. We are not set for good. If we don't understand, we just... It takes a lot of work to somehow make that trip to empathy. And it starts with seeing. I saw him. I didn't make the trip. I speak in many prisons in the United States. There are many prisons in the United States. And I was speaking at one. And this uh, prisons always sober me. I hope you never see the inside of one. But on this part of prison, which happens to be 18 to 24 year old males, they led me in. And uh, there on the, on the floor of, the, of a gymnasium, with, with uh, everyone was coming in, they were going to sit on the bleachers. I'm trying to think what to say, and they start to bring the young men in. And in prison, they take away your name, and they give you a number. Very dehumanizing. So the first person comes in and says, one, they yell their own number as they come in. Two, and they all are dressed in orange jumpsuits, and they go up to the bleachers, and they sit. And they divided them up into three sections. Over here on this side was everyone who had committed a violent crime 
a murder, an aggravated assault, they all sat up there. In the middle group were people who had committed sexual crimes, rapes and the like were in the middle. On the right was everybody they called emotionally unstable. They sat on the right. And in between each group, lots of guards with lots of guns. And between the groups and me, lots of guards with lots of guns. And then me with a the microphone. And it's somewhat disconcerting to speak when there are lots of guards with lots of guns right there. And I thought, what in the world do I have to say to these men? These young men who have already seen more in their life than I will ever see. And I don't even remember what I said, but I must have babbled through something. And about an hour passed, and it was time for them to leave. And they left in reverse order. 90, the guy first leaving said, 89, he came behind them. 88, 87, 86, 86, got to the door, and instead of leaving, he turned a U-turn and came right towards me. 85 followed him, and 84 followed him. And just like that, I had about 30 men in jumpsuits all around me. And the guards, who were supposed to prevent things such as this, were all talking in a little circle. And I kind of said, is this okay? Is this okay? Are we all, we're okay here. And when they saw, they came very quickly. And I thought, they're going to usher these men out. But they didn't. And I think they didn't usher them out because of what they heard. And what they heard was that first man, number 86. Number 86 who's right in front of me, face to face, which means he's at least six foot five, but he's a lot bigger. And he's inches from my, my head, and he's just bawling. His tears are weeping. He's just weeping. And for the next five minutes, he tells me all he's done that brought him here. He tells me about all the lives he's taken. And I can tell you where he was sitting. I know that. He was up in that group because he was very graphic. And then the man beside him, he wasn't weeping, but there, he's misty-eyed, and he's telling me about all he did. And for the next 30 minutes, I'm like a priest. People telling me everything that they've done. And my only job was telling myself, just keep a normal face, keep a normal face. Just listen, just listen. And after about a half hour, the guards finally then did whisk them out. And, and, and then they led me out. They led me out through the four series of locks, locked doors that you, it took to get out of the prison. And the gentleman who was leading me out said, that has never happened before. He said, you know what? Not one of the men in here has a dad. And you just became their father for one half hour. So I have 30 kids in prison. <laughs> and I'm not proud of what they did, but I'm very proud of them. Because when you go to prison, it is the most isolating place on earth. It is the most invisible place on earth. And if you're not seen, there's no one there to have empathy. And for one half hour or one hour, <laughs> I got to see them. I got to love them. And I don't know if it makes any difference in their lives. I don't know. Maybe they're all still there. But it's my hope that one least one of them said, there is this tall, bald man, and he came and he sees me and he likes what he sees. And it's my hope that that seeing and that liking, it does more than just it was more than just an event. It was a life-changing moment. Maybe I, maybe I humanized them for just that much. Maybe I took away their number for that long. Can you imagine walking through life as a number? tell you this. I'm going to go. <laughs> my father, he lives in the house that I lived in. 
He sleeps in the room that I slept in, that I locked myself in for two years. He sleeps in that room with my mom. They still live in that house. And I live, lived up northern Minnesota in my state, and so I had to drive down to Minneapolis, the bigger city, to fly out. And whenever ever anyone flies me anywhere, they fly me out of Minneapolis, so I usually have to leave the night before and stay at my parents' house that night because I'm on the early flight. I hate being on the early flight, but I'm always on the early flight. So at night before, I was spending the night at my parents' And I woke up about 3 in the morning, and I had my roller bag, and I'm in the lobby, love their, not lobby, foyer of their house, and I'm about to leave. And I'm bleary-eyed, I'm kind of stepping towards the door. And I, and I reach the door, I put my hand, a lot, hand on the handle, and then I hear something behind me, and it's footsteps, some step. It's my dad, he's coming upstairs. And I can always tell, remember my dad's footsteps and my mom's footsteps. They're very different footsteps. My dad's are heavy in. And he reaches the top. It's about uh, I'm three. He's always asleep. This is odd for him to be awake. He sleeps between one and five. He doesn't sleep very long anymore. A little older he is. And he gets to the top, and he hasn't been asleep at, at all. He's been waiting for me to get up. I can tell that. He doesn't have the strap marks from his CPAP machine on his cheeks. He's been awake all night. He has the same clothes he had on the day before. And he gets to the top of the stairs, and he walks right towards me. And he takes his right hand, and he puts his right hand when he reaches me on my left shoulder, and he squeezes my left shoulder. And he says, Jonathan, I have to tell you something. I am so proud of you. I love you so much. And he to my shoulder, and I squeeze turned around and walked back down the stairs. That's all he got up to say. Significant because he has never told me that before in 47 years of life. First time he told me he loved me. I just stood looking at him, watching him go. And I went out to my car. And I turned on the ignition and I drove about one block. And on one block, out of nowhere, all of a sudden, Tears, tears, tears. I had to pull over. It was a real ugly cry. I'm glad you weren't there. <laughs> and for 10 minutes, I just cried, cried, cried. And after 10 minutes, I get back onto the road. And do you know what? I felt like I could do anything. I felt like I could do anything. Because there is a special... There's a special mantle, I believe, a father has over their children's life. And when they speak over their children, they just don't, they just don't say words. It brings something to life. And there's one that a mother has, and a mother has another special ability, and it brings something to life. Then there's one that we have over each other, humanity, the people, our sphere of influence, and we speak over them, and we bring something to life. We bring them to life when we see them. Because that's what I, I heard from my dad. I see you. I like what I see. And when he makes me visible, all of a sudden I can feel the empathy from him. I feel the connection from him. And it starts with visibility. And visibility starts with those two messages. You want to know how to do it. I see you. I like what I see. Do you say those words exactly? Of course not. You show it in every way you can. And I see you, and I like what I see. It leads to being someone being visible, and all of a sudden you are open to being empathetic. And they feel it, and it brings something to life. Empathy isn't a soft emotion. It's not a, it's not a, a gentle thing. Empathy brings dead things to life. It is one of the most powerful forces on this earth. And it only happens one at a time. And it happens every choice you make. How many people do you see in a day? 
this choice and this choice to see them, to make them visible, and this choice and this choice to I see you, I like what I see. And all of those things lead to something not only brought to life in them, it brings something to life in you. And what is that? Empathy. And all of a sudden this world that seems like it's full of others, all of a sudden is filled with you. And when the world is full of you, all of a sudden it feels a lot more kind. It's a gentler place to live. You can walk through it with poise. Because the world isn't full of others. It's full of us. It's full of you. It's not a soft emotion. It's the most courageous thing you can do in today's world. Take the easy way out. Walk on by. I've done it many times. Probably so have you. Want to be courageous? Make someone visible. Because I am an author, I get to read two pages. Because you are stuck here, <laughs> you get to listen. This is not an attempt to sell a book. It actually does fit. It does not fit without my glasses. This is about a young man who has Tourette's. His name is Sam. It's not my story, though I do have Tourette's. It's Sam's story. This is his D-Day, his diagnosis day. Some of you have had a diagnosis day. You've had a D-Day, or you've known someone who's had a D-Day. And a diagnosis day is a painful thing to go through. This happened when he was six. Sam has it. Question is, how bad? The pediatrician smiled like he got off on destroying a kid's life. Like children frequently went to sleep normal and woke up monsters who couldn't keep their damn bodies still. He stared at me waiting, and my right hand twitched. One day he'll flail like a windmill in spring. You see, this has seasons. Then the wind will die, and you won't see anything for months. He turned to my mom. Now, there are some experimental drugs. Who the hell is supposed to pay for those, my stepdad said. The doctor rose. I can see you need some time, Bill. He shook my six-year-old hand, gave my stepdad a pat on the back, and slipped out of the examining room, leaving the three of us to stare at my jerking hands and shoulders. What did he say? Ma, Bill, when's it going to go away? Bill stood and paced the room. Go away. Your twitches won't ever stop. He cursed and kicked the doctor's swivel chair. I stared at Mom. Well, never? Not even when I'm older? Mom scooted her chair in front of mine. He says, you have Tourette's. I mouthed the word, and she leaned forward and stroked my arms, gentle at first, then harder and harder, and mixed with tears. I knew she was trying to rub that bad word out of me. What does that mean, I asked. It means... Bill said, you can forget about ever running my machines. My hand squeezed the jacket Bill gave me, the green one, with tarboy on the front and a cement mixer on the back. I pulled free of Mom and grabbed Bill's pant leg. I can stop it. Please, Bill. I started to cry. Ah, I'll be still. I promise. Old Bill turned his back. Mom closed her eyes. And even at six years old, I knew... I was alone. It's a rough start for Sam. He thinks, does anyone see me? And he thinks of old Bill who turns his back. No. Anyone like what he sees? He thinks of his mom who closes her eyes. No. But into his life, in the story, comes someone who just shows up, like Susie was in her name, it turns out, who came into my room, who just showed up, comes into his life, just shows up, and all of a sudden, there's no reason he should show him empathy at all. It doesn't make any sense given the life situation. They don't, they're not even anything alike. He's old. He's young. Sam is young. 
Sam is living, he's not, you've had him, he's, he's dying. It doesn't make any sense. But the gentleman sees him, he likes what he sees, he makes him visible, he feels something, something comes to life, it's empathy, something comes to life in Sam, it's life. And all of a sudden, he's going another way. Like Susie comes into my room, talks to me for one hour. I don't know what she says. But she sees me. She makes me visible. Something comes to life in her. It's empathy. Something comes to life in me. It's life. And I'm out of that room. Like you. I don't know what you, who it's going to be. But you make that choice today. You see someone. You make them visible. Something comes to life in you. It's empathy. Something comes to life in them. It's life. And they are going another direction. And neither your life nor their life will ever be the same. And it's not done on a society level. Creating a society of empathy. I don't know how to do that. But I know it can happen for one person. And if one person and another person and another person, we start to push back at what is so easily pushing at us. I want to thank you for coming. I want to thank you for honoring me with your time. I'm going to open things up here. Um, so if you want to have, uh, open things up. And thank you so much. Reason. I think I speak for all of us when I say this was really inspiring. And it's very clear with what's happening all over the world today that we need to make a much bigger effort um, to feel for one another. On any given day, you turn on the TV and hear of horrible things happening all over the planet. Um, we can't accomplish anything without our empathy, our humanity, except for this. Um, we'll let the session go on for a little longer so we can take some questions from the audience. I'm sure there are many. Please. No, I I think this is my only Singaporean talk. This this particular talk. Yeah, I will be I will be on a panel tomorrow. I'll be I'll be reading from a story a book a different book later on today. Um, I don't know where that is. Is that a tent? Some nice tent. <laughs> um, and then tomorrow there will be a, a discussion about mental health issues in literature because most of my stories have a mental health, a character who has a mental health issue as the main character. Um, and, and, and part of that is just my passion for having people on the margins seen so they become the main person in my stories. I try to bring them into the mainstream, into the center. So that's, that's tomorrow, that's, but, but not this talk again. Although, if you'd love to have me back, I'd love to come. <laughs> I must say, I love this, this, this place. <laughs> um, <let's go. clears throat> Thank you very much, Jonathan. Yeah. Uh, the last question reminds me to ask, have you spoken to teenagers? Yeah, I, I spend, I think I spend half of my half of my speaking life in schools, in young people's prisons, in, um, in the United States we have uh, many mental facilities, uh, mental health facilities for uh, children. So I spend a lot of time talking to kids, students, and it's, it's remarkable how many of them resonate with that sense of invisibility. And that's why I talk so much about, as a youth, I tell so many stories about children is because I don't know when we get, when are we taught, when are we taught not to be empathetic? But we're taught. Somehow it comes by our surroundings. I don't know who else. You can, well, I, I do know, I have some ideas, but we're taught that. We, we learn, it's a learned behavior. So yeah, I spend a lot of time sp uh, speaking to, to 
two students, and that turns out to be pretty powerful. They respond well. Um, do you want me to call on people, or do you want to? Okay. Uh, let's um, just, yeah. Hi, um, I'm American, and I wanted to ask you a little bit about empathy. So when I moved to the States, you know, when you're working, everyone on the uh, corridors or lobbies, they all say hi. But before you can say anything further, they, they walk on by. <laughs> so the thing is, is what, what you were saying about the two things that somebody has to do to be empathetic to somebody. I mean, I see you. Everybody sees everybody, of course. But the second thing that you said, which is I like what I see, is that not a tall order, and is that being genuine or not being genuine, even if it's for the two minutes that you see somebody? I mean, how do you do the second thing, which is a little bit hard to do? You know? I, okay, it's a great question. I think the first thing is hard to do. I don't think we truly see many people at all. As we walk through our lives, we may say hi, but I'm not seeing you. I'm, I'm not, I, I am not connecting on you in any sense that gives you a sense that, especially in America, high is, is like, I don't even, it, it's, not, it's not even a greeting. It's that thing that we say so we can move on. <laughs> right? If someone asks us, how are you doing? We say, fine. We don't say it because we really are fine. We say it because that is the next proper thing to say. Then we can get on with our lives, which has nothing to do with the person who's just asked us that. Actually taking the time to see someone is a whole different, that's a whole different nature of a, of a thing. And I don't think it can be done, and I, I wouldn't think it would be done on, on the streets as you're passing 100,000 people. That, 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 but through our days, are we not prompted? Do you not see, are there not certain people who stick out to you during your day as you're going through your life in the different things that you do? And for whatever reason, you notice them. And you notice them in a different way than you notice everybody else. And when that, I, I, I happen to believe there's almost a, it's almost a spiritual noticing. It's an identifying. So, somebody has come into your life and you see them uniquely. Those are the people who I would challenge us, challenge myself. Boy, there are, there are thousands of people here. Why? But I'm noticing this person. I, I can go out of my way to say more than hi here. And when I do that, I am finally seeing them. And in my seeing them, going out of my way, can I communicate that they are, they are worth seeing? Can I give somebody worth? Not everybody. We can't do that, all right? Or else we'd spend our whole life schizophrenic. But there are a couple people who pop out at us often. And I would suggest go for those. Go for those people. Those people who through your day you just notice in a special way. If, you st if we start there, I think it'll lead to something bigger. That's a good question. Yes. What about the person who feels invisible? What can they do to obtain empathy? I have, that's a great question. There is a, the people who feel invisible, and I know this because I, ha I was one. I can tell you what doesn't work is cocooning yourself in your invisibility. There is something, and I don't understand it. I think it must be a rule of life that, that somehow it makes sense. When you, when you see someone else, it comes back to you. And I don't know why that is. But I bet a lot of you can attest to that. When you reached out, somehow it brought something in you to life. It wasn't just good for them. It's like a gift that you give. When you give a gift, is it not a joy to see someone open it? Isn't that the joy? <laughs> oh my, and, and just, you want them, and sometimes you give a gift and it's a special gift, and so you wait and you wait and you wait. You can't, 
you can hardly stand it because you just want to see them open this gift. That, that inside of you, as an, a, someone who feels invisible, that already starts to bring something to life. That's already a stirring inside of your heart that's moving you towards connection. And it's almost a rule that when we start to do that individually and, and we keep on doing it, even though it doesn't feel at first like it's coming back, it does come, it gets reciprocated. I don't know why that is. I have no, I have no explanation for it. It's almost like it's hardwired into our universe that we give and somehow it's things start to come back. It's a gift. And, and th think of all the gifts you've given. So um, what would I say to that person? I would say start beginning to show the same kind of... What would you like to have happen to you? Start doing that. And I bet it starts to happen to you. It just does. Um, I, I guess I have no explanation. I'm just glad it works that way. I guess we'll take two more questions because we're out of time. Um, first, just thank you. Really, really moving. And I particularly appreciate that you've shown us the link between empathy and empowerment. And that's really amazing. Good. And my question might be a tangent, so feel free just to say no. Um, but do you have any thoughts on the role of art in empathy? There are very few things in life that connect on the, that I think touch the soul, like art. Whether it is music, music transports me. Sometimes looking at a painting transports me. Anytime something transports me, I think it has a unique type of a power for, for bringing something to life inside of me. So we're talking about the same types of things, life-giving things. Empathy gives life. Art brings out life. If we can use those even together, what if somehow we could use music in our pursuit to bring empath empathy? It is, it, it's a fantastic question. And I bet one of you much wiser than me could put the two together in a much better way. But they both touch the same spot, so I think they're related. I just don't know how. I'm just glad they are. Uh, hi, uh, thanks. Uh, thanks for the yeah. talk. Uh, what's, what do you think is the, uh, how is uh, empathy different from or similar to compassion? Compassion, compassion is for me seeing and, and, and even, even beginning to feel I should do something. I should do something here. There's a need here and I feel it. Empathy is there's a need here, I feel it, but my heart is going beyond I just see it. It is somehow being put into the other. I'm, I'm seeing the perspective, I'm feeling it from their perspective. I'm not feeling it from I'm the one who has the solution here. I'm feeling it from their side. And I feel like I'm walking in their shoes. It's that next step, and it's those types of moments when I am actually moved, and I don't know that I'm feeling what they're feeling, but it sure feels like I am. At those types of moments when, when, I, when I am most likely to act. Because I can feel compassion for a lot of things. But empathy, I don't know how much room I have. Because empathy puts me so intimately involved with the hurt that you can't feel you can't feel for everybody it's almost like your heart is called to certain people that's why i say you're not going to be able to see everybody and do this it's those people who somehow they stick out to you as you go through your world 
that somehow your heart is being moved and you're actually almost in their spot. Go there. Somehow there's a connection there. Start there. Empathy is a powerful thing. It's, just, it's, it's a powerful thing. I felt it with these inmates I told you about, especially the first two. I don't know if I felt it with everybody, but those first two I did. It's a great question. Hi, can I have one last question? Sure, we can do it. That has to be the last one. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, uh, it seems to me that what you're saying is that there has to be some kind of connection to, for empathy to take place. Um, this is a, a question on, uh, I understand invisibility expresses the sense of not being um, noticed. Invisibility sometimes expresses itself in anger, or very often does express itself in anger, I think. So... How do you reach out in empathy to anger, which is an expression of pain? I don't know that empathy is something we can conjure up. I don't think it's something that I can say, I, I, I know it's not. I am going to feel empathetic for this. I see this person is hurting. They are angrily pushing back. I am going to act out of empathy. I can't maybe do that. However, I can still act. I have, we all have, I don't know how many of you, how, how many close friends you can carry. I can't, I can't live with a whole bunch of close friends. My life, I have some. And it's not because I don't want more. It's just, that's all I can it's all my heart has room for. And then I have so many other friends who are just like on the next circle. And, 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 I, and I try to keep on adding, but every friend you let in, is, it, they're draining to us. And so when you see someone who's pushing back in anger, perhaps the best thing you can do is basically communicate, I am not going anywhere. You can push as hard as you want. I am going to still be here. And when you are ready for me, I'm going to be ready for you. If you can communicate that message, that begins to give them an opportunity to act contrary to their impulse. I don't understand it, but there's this woman, there's this man, and they are not leaving. Everyone else in my life is leaving, but they're not leaving. And maybe that's not empathy that you're feeling. It's just this drumbeat of care. It's actually just humanity. It's I am going to be here and I'm not going. It's a good place to start because when someone's going like this, it's very hard to, 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 to make that jump to empathy. But you can make that drumbeat of humanity. I'm going to stay here no matter what. Again, I thank you for coming. You honored me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Keegan. It makes me very sad to have to close this session.